Tom Steele knows everything there is to know about security because he is a genius and because he works for Lyft Security. If you haven't heard of them, you should know them. They are who will save you from embarrassing yourself on the world wide web. Um, but uh, I'm not going to waffle any longer. Tom Steele has built uh, a Meteor app to help him do his day job. Uh, so I'm going to let him introduce it. But uh, everybody, Tom, he's on the screen. And Tom, everybody, everyone say hello to Tom. Okay, so hi, London. Uh, I work at Lyft with Adam and David, who you probably met. And Matt. And Matt. Hi, Matt. That's him. Oh, yeah. Matt, there's you. Hi, Tom. Anyway, uh, here's a project that I started back in early 2013. Uh, actually, my last employer, so that's funny. Um, <laughs> But uh, so we, we, uh, me and a coworker, we got two months to basically develop this this application that would let us manage all this data that we we're taking in during testing. And when I say testing, what I mean is breaking into stuff and hacking systems. Woo. Um, so obviously the application is built with Meteor, but the way we designed this tool to work uh, or this application to work is we designed the data input to mostly be. Um, language agnostic. Um, so rather than so, give, give a bit of background. That when we're doing when we're doing the network style penetration testing, uh, we're using a lot of automated tools, and those automated tools all generate output in a different way, as you can imagine they do. Um, so for instance, imagine a bunch of like five different tools generating XML with five different outputs. Well, we need to all get that into Meteor, um, and then work. So, but rather than having the app, you know. For instance, take and ingest those XML files, parse them out in a certain database. We actually uh, provide a Python API as well as a Go API and a Ruby API so that users could go in and write their own parsers as tools evolve or change, or they came up with new tools, and they wouldn't have to mess with the app. Um, and the app is meant to be self hosted, um, so there isn't sort of such cloud instance or anything. So that's why I have kind of these languages there. Um, I started with Meteor 0.5.1. Uh, does that give me street cred? Yeah. Damn <laughs> straight. Pull the meat steps. All right. All right. Um, a little bit of statistics. It has 68 Meteor methods, and it has six collections. Um, and then the other thing is more collections versus just having everything in, in um, kind of these nested objects. Uh, turns out when you're using MongoDB or a document somewhere, if you have, if you go to create an array of objects, you're probably doing something wrong. So just have relationships. Um, and then smaller publications. This is still a problem in the app now, and we're seeing a lot of difficulties with lots of data. When you start, when you see how we're publishing stuff, it doesn't work out well when you have large data sets. Um, so for instance, this is how we publish stuff now. So for instance, a host is like an IP address with a bunch of stuff on it. And this is how we publish all the hosts. And it pretty much just publishes them all at once. It's obviously much better to only publish what you need to, the user to see at one point in time. Because uh, if you load up, you know, for instance, 5,000 hosts, well, all 5,000 of those are going to be user at one point when they, you know, they load up the application. Um, this is a much better way of tackling that. So there's things called there's a collection called projects, and here we simply just publish a listing of the projects because that's what the user needs at that one view. So I know it's kind of just you know blog code on the page, but you know think about that. Um, you know when you when you write your your publish your your, your uh, publications. Okay, I'm going to talk quick about Meteor Security because I think that's like much more useful information than eBoot, uh, but I'll go quick. All right, so read security and as fast as I can do it. Okay, read the docs. They're really good, and you should read all of them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, remove auto-publish and insecure. I, I think you should just do this starting out. Once you've written your little you know, Hello World application, just do this when you write your app, because you're going to have to do it anyway. And if you don't, you're going to write a bunch of client code that you're probably going to have to replace. Uh, so just do this. Okay, information exposure. Can everyone see the image at the bottom here? Yeah. Yeah. What's that doing? 
you're exposing the user's collection. I'm not logged in. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> so um, I just went, I clicked on the, well, hmm, how can I say this about exposing it? I clicked on, <laughs> I clicked on the second app my eyes saw on the main me here, and I just ran this, and I got all the users. Um, now, there used to be a really, really popular app that was both a that would actually expose people's Twitter access tokens. That was fun. So, uh, never publish, you know, publish more than, don't publish more than you should, and don't publish what you shouldn't. So, you know, be very strict with what you're thinking about, and don't disclose the information. Um, does anyone in the crowd remember the security bug in 0 0.5.8.1? No. <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> so this meetup started at 0.6. Oh, okay, cool. So well, anyway, this is relevant to you because in 0 0.5.8.1, if you had allow rules, there was actually some logic to be able to brute force data out of an allow rule because of security vulnerability in Meteor. So, um, basically, the rule is don't let people enumerate your data by doing things like brute force. Uh, okay, info validation. Validate for type length content. So if you want it to be a string, make sure it's a string, make sure it's a certain length, and make sure it's containing the content you want. Um, because if you don't, you're going to have an objection, and also you're going to have things like mass assignments. And in my opinion, meteor methods over a loud and I. Okay, so this long bit of code, focus on the red. This is a meter method, and this is actually from layer. So it's validating that when you pass it a name, it's a string, and then it matches as a regex. Now if I take this away, it will still run. But what happens when I call my meter method with an object? Well, it turns out you can just inject objects. Uh, and so the majority of meter books I've seen don't have any recommendations as to how to validate the content you're putting in. So that you, there's probably a lot of applications that have these injection points. Um, uh, rate limiting. So I haven't seen anyone be implement like brute force protection as far as like guessing inside of passwords or trying to brute force data. And I also haven't seen anyone protecting from um, you know denial of service issues by, for instance, when you allow a user to inject or to, to create an object and put it in the collection, do you ever check to make sure that they're not in, you know, inputting too many objects? No. What happens if I put 200,000 objects in your database? Okay, now the demo. Can I share my screen? Okay. Uh, so this is the main view after you log in. Um, and so I, I guess it's not that interesting. When you click things, you know, it loads up your... At this point, it does this really bad thing where it loads your entire project from the uh, from the app. Hold on, I'm gonna mute you so I can hear my don't hear myself. Wait, can you do that? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> um, so yeah, it kind of has these cool features like export, so you can just uh, save it as JSON. So it will save the entire project as JSON, which you could later import. Uh, but we can load it up. So. Uh, yeah, the first kind of view here is just a list of the hosts. So you can, maybe you can see that these are IP addresses. Um, and the kind of strategy we took with managing this data is we wanted to know if multiple people were working on the same test and were looking at the same sets of hosts. We didn't want one tester to look at one host while the other tester was looking at the same thing. So we kind of came up with this color coding system. And this all, you know, as with Meteor, it, it all does, you know, kind of like live reloading, but you can kind of click through here and change the color of things. Um, and we kind of came up with our own color basis. Uh, and then so, so that's like a host level, and then you can come down here, and you can get into the ports for a particular host, and the ports have that same thing, which is kind of cool. Um, and you can also, you know, do apply filters, which is neat. Uh, and this is cool because it's just using, yeah, go ahead. Um, just uh, just to pause, like from a high level, like what what does it really do for the for the people at home? What is layer? What's layer's like vital function? So layer's vital function is to manage 
all the data that you gather during a, a network penetration test. And so it's to make sure that you have a central repository for the data and that you can collaborate, collaboratively work on the data together, uh, so with multiple people. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how much detail to go into how this works, but uh, these filters are basically just adding, they're, basically, they're, they're running a Mongo uh, find on, on the client, and they're adding you know, a bunch of uh, filters to, to the query. So when you click this, it's basically saying, okay, give me all the colors that aren't gray uh, and such. And you, know, you can add services with defaults and things like that. Um, that's cool, and then you can edit this. So if you want to say if one fifty was telnet, do that. And you can click these forward and back buttons to just cycle through. So that's cool. Um, we can add credentials. So if we run a test and we found you know valid credentials, you can add them there. Um, You can also control collaborators. So I have this other user called Bob. Um, okay, so there's collaborators, so I can remove and add them. Um, so I have this other user named Bob, and it also has chat. So if we were both, me and Bob, were working on a test. And, uh, <laughs> Then it would be his messages. And you can see that too. Sounds kind of cool. Yeah. Um, okay. So probably the interesting bit that's probably different than most media applications is since this was meant to be hosted on like you know a single user machine or within a small group that you trust, we do have these interesting settings. Um, that, for instance, this one, which says allow client side updates. And what this lets you do is it lets you, uh, basically it turns off all the allow, or all the, uh, it turns off all the allow deny methods that we have. It basically allows the client to do just about anything. Um, and so we control that through a settings collection. And what you can do is you can confirm this and then allow it. And then you come back to your project. Um, you can you know you can, you can start scripting basically on the client, and we found this is really cool for a lot of our users because they can write these things that we're calling browser scripts, which we have a bunch of them here. Um, and so what this let us do was when I was when I was working with my previous team, we had about twenty users, and they would all come to me with like these very particular wants and needs and features, and I just say no, just go write a browser script because. You can basically just write JavaScript, plug a function into the browser console, and let Meteor do all these things for you and generate data and do all kinds of stuff. Um, so, for instance, say we wanted to turn all the ports that are 443, we wanted to turn those orange. Well, you can take this script here. It's a it's a lot of client side updates. So we enable that on our browser console. I'm doing this one-handed. It changed, so we can watch it change before our eyes to layer orange. And boom! Oh. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Incredibly insecure to do this. Like in all, in most circumstances, you probably wouldn't want to do this. Or if you did, you'd want to lock it down a bit further than we did. But it just shows to show you, like the meteor has this incredible flexibility for when you want to build apps that go beyond consumer applications. You know, like for, for instance, like an administrative dashboard, being able to just like ad hoc script data, just like you're in a database, is kind of cool. Um, yeah. So those are kind of the cool, yeah, yeah. 
So those are kind of things that I really like about Layer. Does anyone, do you have, does anyone have any particular question or do you want me to show them or snippets of the code you want know me to talk about? I have a different question, but it's not strictly about Layer, it's about something you mentioned earlier. Yeah, I would love to talk about the security stuff more than Layer, so please. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, my question is about rate limiting, and you mentioned that, um, well, obviously you can, you can do rate limiting, right, if you have uh, sign-in users, because you have meteor methods and you can like check the user ID, but right. what if you have, uh, what if you don't have sign-in users, or, it, or if you expose a part of your application that has to write stuff to the database, and you don't have users yet in that part of the application, it's like landing page or something. Um, how would yeah. You, yeah. How would you accomplish so, rate in that situation? Traditionally, you can, you can do that with Nginx if you're, you're working with an HTTP API. Okay. Um, but with WebSockets, I think it's quite a bit differently, and I haven't seen a good solution. So I think it's kind of an unsolved problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, in critical portions, you can track by IP address. So you can check by that IP address that's coming in. Yeah, that can be spooked. That though. sounds really annoying. It sounds like quite a bit of overhead. Um, so I, I strictly brought it up because it's something that I, I haven't seen, and it's it's funny. As the security landscape changes, we see that um, we're getting better at preventing the things that we find in a lost top ten. Um, but the things that I've seen in a lot of the applications that we're testing, the applications in, in, in general, is that there's no thought of how do I prevent this person from just breaking my app? And bringing it down. Mm -hmm. um, how do I prevent them from inserting a million rows in Mongo? Or, I'm sorry, a million documents in Mongo. And so, those are things that I think are going to become more and more important because, uh, especially in the Node community, but some of us are developing applications that we're just trying to keep up. We're trying to keep users coming to the site. And if your site's down, you're going to go out of business. Um, so I think I think some of these problems are important to think about, and then see if you can solve them and contribute, you know, contribute these, these, uh, these solutions. Uh, I, I haven't sort of implemented a pseudo solution, though I'm not sure how good it is. Yeah, I would love to. I would love to uh, take a look at it. Let you know what I think. Yeah. Any other uh, questions? Uh, any more questions? Any more questions? Resident security expert on them, please, sir. <laughs> um, generally, yeah. in your experience, how would you rate Node from a security perspective? Uh, yeah. You know, um, so I don't think there's any security problems related directly to Node Core because Node Core is fairly light in what it does. You know, it's it's the uh, it's basically just V8, which is a separate, you know, separate concern, and then it's a bunch of stuff bolted onto it. What, what we see is that when you're not able to, it's, it's when you're creating web applications in, in, in particular, when you're not able to leverage a framework that has, you know, trusted secure defaults, we see that those defaults, we see that we see that holes get created. Um, in particular, I see, we see a lot of problems with Express. Uh, because Express just doesn't have a, it's, to me, and this is, this is purely my personal opinion, but Express doesn't feel like it has a, a uh, culture of validation if frameworks can have a culture, right? It doesn't feel like that's part of a standard pattern. And I hate to compare you know, framework to framework, but when I look at something like Happy, for instance, Happy documentation has a validate portion of route handler, and then it's tightly coupled with joy as well. So you can write these really strong validations. Um, and so in general, I think I was I think I was fine, and I think just as secure as anything else. Thank you. Cool. Any more questions? Uh, I think now would be a good time to take a break. Uh, everyone, that was Tom Steele of this Security telling us about future security. <laughs>